John Everson is with us this morning from the Marius Group. Good morning, Johnny. Gentlemen, good morning. How is everybody? Excellent. We are uh, welcoming you to the program and, and so glad to have you, sir. The program has been changed, John. This is correct <laughs> one's English today. There, there you go. Well, in that case, I could be in real trouble this morning. You and I so. will be the side by side then, John. <laughs> yeah, I can paint a real good picture to, a lot of times to people, but the words that I use may not have been necessarily the most appropriate word, but people get my point eventually. Yeah. But they sound good to you. That's what the point they I'm trying to make. They sound great to me, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> they may not sound good to Rob, <laughs> but they sound great to me. <laughs> John, markets are closed today, but they will be reopened tomorrow, correct? Yep, uh, you are correct about that. Markets are closed. And, Rob, it's interesting the comment you made about federal employees and stuff. And that's actually the reason why I'm in the office uh, today is because uh, for us, you know, days like President's Day and what used to be Columbus Day, uh, Indigenous Peoples Day, whatever you call that now, a day like today, uh, because of the fact that there's a lot of federal government employees here in the Eastern Panhandle, uh, those are actually good days for those folks that are clients with us to get a hold of us and to uh, to discuss things. So, you know, that's um, you know because of everybody trying to make that exodus. Those that didn't go to the mountains, those that de- decided to stay here in the Eastern Panhandle, it's it's a good day for us to uh, to be available for them. Yes, because uh, as, as we all uh, know, you guys don't exactly you, you don't function as stockbrokers. You are financial advisors, John. And I think the last time you were with us, exactly. you pointed out the difference. Yes. Correct. And in fact, you know, it, it, it is interesting because and I, I've literally had people before who've said, well, a day when the markets are closed, what do you guys do? Because there's no trading that you can be loading and such. Well, you know, we spend, you know, an exceptionally large uh, portion of our time thinking strategically about client situations and where they are, and you know, relative to their goals and their time horizons and how are they trying to get there and just reviewing exactly uh, where we are and what type of move, you know, should they be given consideration to next? John, uh, while the markets are closed today, there is still information that's going to be coming out this week that we are waiting for to find out uh, how our economy is doing and what direction our markets will be going in. How do you gauge that information as it comes across in the days it's released? Uh, It's a great, uh, great question. You know, one of the things, and and, and you are right, there are still things, uh, while we're closed today, there's still things taking place. And especially you think about it, we're uh, rolling up here, what, in about a week and a half to the midpoint of 2023. We're now almost halfway through the year. And what's interesting is, and I was actually thinking about this uh, this morning, kind of going over some stuff that uh, that we could talk about, uh, thinking about the difference that a year makes and kind of the the, the caution that, that Phil McCoy and myself always use when we're talking to people to remind them, be careful about looking in the rear view mirror, trying to make the decision as to which way they should go next. And so, you know, a lot of times when you use those, those, those lagging metrics, you know, to try to gauge things by, and the, the classic example is a year ago at this point in time, you know, and it didn't matter where you had money invested, you were beaten up pretty good, pretty badly. And so as a result, you know, there are a lot of people that, you know, who tend to have this sort of a knee-jerk reaction to the events that have already occurred. And you have to really guard against that because you have to be careful about what's the next decision that you make going forward. And it may be counter to what you would intuitively think that it should be. And so uh, that's, that's why we, we, we're always cautioning people to remain balanced, diverse, identify what their goals and objectives are, understand how much risk and volatility they should accept inside their portfolio, and make their decisions based on those types of factors. Yeah, rearview uh, Linda is an easy way to look at your, your success or lack of success. Yes. Uh, however, looking forward uh, is much, much more challenging. And the parameters we use while looking forward are the para- are the uh, what we see today in a very, very short term. How do you and Phil and others look past the daily and weekly fluctuation and come up with a long-term goal other than diversity? I, I yield to yeah, diversity. Yeah, yeah. That's yep. easy. Yep. But I'm looking yep. for something that may be a, a, a sector that may look very attractive. How do you identify that attractive sector? Yeah. 
so so I, it's a great question, Mr. Stelfield. And let me go back uh, about a year ago, and this is interesting. I was on with you folks uh, just about uh, a year ago. I remember it was sometime. Uh, it was either in uh, late June, early July. Uh, uh, Phil McCoy wasn't available one day, and he said, John, can you fill in for me? Absolutely be happy to. And one of the things that uh, – and I had emailed Rob uh, some slides uh, from a, a deck of material that we had been using. Uh, the material actually was provided to us by uh, the research department at J.P. Morgan, okay, and their asset management division. And one of the things that was interesting about it, uh, and one of the things we looked at a lot – just a year ago, was looking at consumer sentiment. And when you measure the consumer sentiment index, whether you folks remember this or not, June 2022, the consumer sentiment index hit the all-time lowest point that that index has ever been measured. So in other words, if you went out and you polled kind of the average person on the street and you asked them, how much confidence do you have in the U.S. economy, where we are as we're going forward? And this time a year ago, you know, you know, it was one of those, if you've burned a little bit of gas off in your gas tank, you probably should go ahead and fill up because before you get to the gas station again, it's probably going to have gone up in price yet again, okay? So we were in that really crazy window of time. You know, experiences at the supermarket were outrageous. Not that they're any better, you know, necessarily today, but, but things were, were really bad. And one of the things we talked about then was how when you went back over the last 50 years and you looked at consumer sentiment, and in that 50-year window of time, there had been eight times where that index had hit a peak, and there were eight times where that index had hit the bottom, a trough, and uh, you know before it would start to go back up, and then it hits a peak and starts to work its way back down over a period of years. And what was interesting about that is that Financial markets, particularly the stock market uh, specifically, and I'm going to reference the S&P 500 here, okay? Off of those eight peaks off the consumer sentiment index over that 50-year window of time, the S&P 500 for the subsequent 12-month window of time produced an average of just over a 4% return. So think about that for a second. When people are feeling hopeful and optimistic, feeling good about where things are and, you know, the opportunities that are in front of them and stuff, the S&P 500 had produced a 4% average return. If you measured it off of those troughs where consumer sentiment was at its worst point, from that point going forward for the subsequent 12-month window of time, the average return for the S&P 500 was just under 25% per year. Now, let's take that and let's go back to where we were at the end of June of 2022. Measuring consumer sentiment at the worst uh, point that, that that index has ever been measured at, and if you go from uh, – and this is just a trailing one-year window of time. So if I went from uh, June the uh, – uh, the whatever Friday's date was, the 16th, 17th, coming forward through to today, the S&P 500 is up just a, a few one-hundredths of a percent shy of a 20 percent return. So here's the point to my, my uh, uh, response, Mr. Stelfield. You know, we have to look at those things that are, again, we cannot allow the most recent information, uh, you know, to impact our, our decision making. I've always referred to it as anytime someone makes an emotionally driven financial decision, almost always they're going to do the opposite of what they probably should have done. And so for us, a lot of times, it's really helping people to, uh, to kind of uh, guide and steer, if you will, the emotional responses that they have to the things that have, uh, have already taken place. John, that's fascinating, the uh, uh, numbers you just given us. Uh, what was the time frame between, on this, during this 50-year average, time frame between a trough and a peak? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, on average, most of those go from anywhere from, say, about a, uh, uh, a short time window of about two years to um, uh, we've got one that goes from October of 1990 where we had hit a trough, and it, the, the, the index, the consumer sentiment, didn't peak until nearly 10 years later in January of 2000. So, you know, most of those are, you know, relatively – um, again, uh, shorter windows of time 
you know, two to five years. But there are some longer windows in there, you know, that would go six, seven. Uh, with the longest one, it looks like it was was about a, a decade of time where consumer sentiment basically largely, and again, it would, would ebb and flow inside of there, okay? So it would go up a little bit, go down a little bit, but again, before it would finally hit a peak and then start to trend down uh, on a sustained basis. Uh, the peaks and the tr- cross, uh, looking at on the y-axis, are all of them approximately the same, same deep, same high? Uh, no, no, that's a great question. No, and in fact, it's interesting because, um, you know, when you look at the chart, the chart is really, uh, anytime we show this to a client, you know, we always have to, you know, as soon as it flashes on the screen, acknowledge to them, you know, I'm going to explain what you're looking at because it really is, it's a very jagged line as it works its way, you know, from 1971 coming forward over that last you know, half century, and and again, and that's the and it, it's it's a fascinating thing because I've actually had people who have looked at that, and they literally have said to me, John, that's that's basically you're telling me that everything that I'm feeling right now, I have to almost resist that, and to sometimes the answer is that's correct. And again, a lot of people don't realize the discipline to do, you know, uh, to make good decisions is one of the most crucial elements to the success that someone's going to have from a financial point of view. And that's one of the reasons why we tell people that, look, you know, whether you're working with us or somebody who's, who's really good, you know, coaching is a good thing. You know, just because, you know, you did something once and that worked doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work that way for the rest of the entire game. Sometimes there are changes that you do need to make, you know, based on, you know, where you are and, and the ebb and flow that's, uh, that's taking place. Can you use the same historical perspective looking across for individual sectors? Um. You have to be real careful there because, you know, think about this. There's, there's a lot of times where, you know, uh, when you start getting into sector investing where um, there, there are uh, changes that can and will influence how a given sector will play out, okay? So everything from, you know, uh, you know legislative kinds of pressures to, you know, sometimes uh, competition even inside of there or competition – from something that puts a given sector uh, at risk, okay? So there, there are times, I think, where you have to be real careful, and that's, again, we tend to, to, to lean away from sector investing, uh, and that's not to say that there aren't opportunities, because there certainly are, but obviously we try to contain that to a, uh, you know, a, a part of the portfolio where people understand, you know, the ebb and flow that's, that's likely to take place in those types of uh, asset classes. John Everson is our guest here on the program from Ameriprise Financial and the Myriad Group of Financial Advisors on Winchester Avenue in Martinsburg. They are working today. They are in the office. Uh, John, uh, effectively what you're talking to, be, to us about here is contrarianism a little bit in that uh, uh, when the market's, right, when the yeah. market's dropping, this is when you should in, be in, buying. Yes, in, in terms of the emotional response that you have, exactly. And think about this, and we've seen this, this true as well. You know, when, when financial markets, you know, are in the news all the time on a repeated basis, another new high was established and a new high was established, and look at all the money that people were making and so forth, there are people who then get swept up emotionally in that, and all of a sudden, you know, they're like, well, can I, can I give you more money to invest? Well, I'd rather have had that back when we were, were getting beaten up when we were black and blue. That was the best time to put money in. And, and you know, in, those, in that kind of a context, we will still work with people. But a lot of times, as markets continue to move up and someone has new money or someone wants to become a new client, we have to be really careful with the awareness that, look, I don't know what's going to happen next. The last thing we want to do, I, I learned this a long time ago, and this is, this is uh, the advantage of, of someone that's been in this business for, uh, uh, for decades, is a long time ago I learned that people value a return of their money to a greater degree than they, return, than they uh, uh, realize the value of a return on their money. In other words, people don't like to lose their money. Mm-hmm. And so as markets climb higher, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll, we'll take money, park it into a position of cash perhaps, 
take some of that and maybe go in with a, you know, a, a controlled amount of a lump sum, but then turn around and set up a dollar cost averaging arrangement where we're basically now buying on a consistent basis. And we actually did that um, about two years ago with a client. A gentleman had a large rollover, and you know, when we explained what we were going to do, he said, you know, I'm not so sure that I'm real crazy about parking a large chunk of this basically into cash because, you know, I want to be invested in stuff. We explained, look, you know, you, you kind of have to trust us on this one. Don't you know? And I had no, no you know, because our crystal ball is not very good at all. But I've been doing this long enough to be able to get just a little bit of a sense of, you know what, we we had uh, had some tr- some tremendous uh, growth in equities, particularly coming uh, off of the pandemic uh, panic selling in the spring of 2020. And so things had, had, had risen to a point where it just made sense. Let's, uh, let's, let's dollar cost average. And we did that. Uh, that, that individual today uh, now recognizes the value of how we made, helped him to make that transition because we, you know, had we gone in on a lump sum, uh, by the time we'd have been at this point last year, we'd have been really uh, beaten up pretty severely. Good point. Yeah, John, I realize you and Phil and others are not traders. You're looking at it for the long yeah. term. Uh, yes. But for those that are traders, uh, how much does the international market uh, influence the action of the S&P or our markets on a daily basis? What's the... Uh, the- yeah, that's a good question. And, 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 yeah, and I don't know that I could really quantify it in terms of what sort of a, a proportional influence that it has. But make no mistake, though, there are, because you think about this, you know, um, the, the most sort of red, white, and blue companies in America today are still have international influence. You know, Apple sells pro- – well, certainly sells more product around the world than they do here in the U.S., So if you think about it, you know, and that's what I always remind people of is, look, we don't necessarily have to, uh, in some instances, go buy a, you know, a foreign domiciled company to necessarily get international exposure. Sometimes you can actually create that, you know, with uh, uh, firms that that we think of as American-based firms because they are, you know, uh, many companies today, you know, their products are consumed uh, around the globe. You, you good, Bill? You got your, I'm, you I'm got your answer? I've got a question. John's right. been good. He's answered all my questions today. That's good stuff right there. That's good stuff. Hey, uh, and I don't think I've had my English corrected no. yet. So I, I consider this successful. I, you've been on your game. Yeah. No, well, okay, well, then and I'm also. I'm struggling now. I'm struggling. Yeah. Know? Also, he's respectful of you. It's, it's, his, <laughs> oh, it's his co-host that he'll go after if I mispronounce something as simple as an or but. Well, that's, hey, that's, so, well, that's a great point because think about it. If I'm the guest. At some point in time, I may be influenced as to whether or not I would come back. Right? True. <laughs> yeah. We pay Bill big money to get those words right here, John. <laughs> there you go. Big I, money. I get coached at home. I get coached here, John. It's a it's a cruel world. Hey, June. Uh, June hey, that's called life. That's <laughs> it called is, life. It is that. Yeah. June has been a great lesson for why you don't try to time the market, John, because every year that uh, May comes around, they tell you. Sell in May and go away, and June is traditionally one of the worst months for the market in the history of the market, and this has not been that. Yeah, no, ex- ex- exactly, and that's why, again, that's why we always come back. I've often referred to it as one of the things that I believe Phil and I are really good at, are good at is wringing out the emotion out of a situation, and I always tell people, Look, when we come into the conference rooms, you got to check your emotion at the front door because uh, you cannot allow, you know, those those emotions. And, and emotion runs, you know. Again, two greatest motivators to mankind are, in fact, fear and greed. And you know, when you start talking to people about, you know, financial uh, matters, those both ends of that spectrum sometimes weigh in fairly heavily in terms of how people want to think about things. And we find ourselves. Just as much when, when fear starts to creep in and we're trying to talk them through that and, and to understand the logic that needs to go with that, likewise, at the other end of the spectrum, when people are thinking, oh, but my next-door neighbor's making all kinds of money and so forth, and I want to get into that, well, you also, though, don't want to be 
you know, uh, you know, the person that got uh, sort of suckered in at the top, and now you're the one who's kind of caught holding the bag. So you really have to uh, be careful at both ends of that. One last uh, quick question, uh, John. Yeah. Uh, does the emotion come in more at the buying end or the selling end? That's a great question. Emotion is more intense at the when people are inclined to sell. Okay, because again, you got to remember what's going on in their mind is I'm now losing money, and that does not feel good. Okay, most people do not like losing money. People can accept. I'm not making as much money as I could. That response is not nearly as intense as it is when things are going down. And that's where, as we always refer to it, we have to occasionally talk people in off the window ledge to make sure that they don't make decisions that they're eventually going to regret. John, how do folks get in touch with you today to find out more about what we've discussed today? Yep, you can reach the Mary's Group. Here in Martinsburg at 304-263-4343. We're here Monday through Friday and uh, usually between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. And uh, or you can stop by the office and see us here at 1270 Winchester Avenue in Martinsburg, West Virginia. Thanks, John. Great job, man. Much appreciated. Thanks, Very good, John. gentlemen. Have a good day. Thanks, guys. 